Hey there, this is Tristan. Welcome to River City. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. Hey there, this is Tristan. Welcome to River City. Thank you so much for spending some time with us. Our service this morning will last just about an hour. We will spend some time singing together, then listen to an inspirational message from God's Word. We believe in the power of prayer and have a team of individuals that would love to partner with you. Simply text RCC Pray to 97000 and follow the instructions. River City Church, thank you for your generosity. You can continue to give your tithes and offerings online. Every week, you can access your child's curriculum right here. Follow the links under the Kid City section for your child's video for the week. River City family, we have some exciting news. The RCC app is now available. Simply text RCC app to 77977 or search the App Store for River City Church Lewiston and take River City with you wherever you go. During the week, don't forget to check out River City online. We will have services, devotionals, prayer, and worship all happening for you. Find us at rivercity.online.church or on our Facebook page, www.facebook.com slash rcclewiston. If you have any questions about what's going on here at River City, please reach out to the church office at 208-743-7101, Monday through Thursday, 10 a.m. through 4 p.m. Thanks again for being here. We hope you have a fantastic day.
this is God, this King of glory. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. Who is this man who died upon a tree? His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus.
me still Do I fall? Do I fall? Although I fail He loves me still Over me His grace prevails forever 
Good morning, River City Church. Happy New Year. I have the privilege of diving back into the Church on Mission series from the book of Acts. And uh, so, first sermon of 2021, right? At, at the start of a fresh new year. This is when a preacher stands up and gives a, a, an, a, an encouraging and uplifting hurrah type of message, right? However, where... I get to pick up our series today is actually back in Acts chapter 6. And it goes all the way through the beginning of Acts chapter 8. This is a challenging passage. This isn't necessarily a feel-good passage. There's persecution. There's great confrontation for the believers. and, And there's martyrdom. And there is loss. So, Acts chapter 6, starting at verse 8. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Verse 9, opposition arose. If you and I had been standing right here at this point in time, in this moment, watching this scene unfold... After we've heard Jesus talk about the tearing down of civilization, he was teaching about eschatology, which is end times. Okay, we surely would have thought this is it the beginning of the end. This is the moment when when Frodo turns to his his buddy Sam and says, I'm glad to be with you, Samwise Gamgee, here at the end of all things. Right? This is it. But we have the luxury today, 2,000 years later, knowing that this was not the beginning of the end. This was, in fact, the beginning of the beginning. This is the opportunity for God's kingdom to advance. The moment when Christianity moves out. When the church doesn't just stay within their comfort zone and, and wait for the unbelieving and far from God to come to them, right? But... What did it take to get them moving? It sounds really exciting. The church is moving out. The gospel is being spread. But what did it take to get them moving? It's a pain, it's a grief, persecution, sacrifice, an inconvenient disruption to the routine, fear, anxiety, pandemonium. As much as I don't like it, God will use whatever it takes to get his church on mission. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we need you today. God, we've, we've always needed you. At the end of an incredibly difficult, traumatic, and tragic year, I want to stand firm knowing that the gospel is true today as it was back then. I don't want to belittle the difficulty that people are facing or, or, or the grief that they're experiencing, but Jesus, I know that there is hope in you. Just like you promised 2,000 years ago, your hope is still here today. And so, Lord, I, I ask that you would challenge us today. God, that you would meet us in this moment, in this place, in these feelings, so that we can fix our eyes on you. Amen. Hey, if it looks like a duck and it walks like a duck, it's a duck, right? My parents live in Hamamatsu, Japan. And back in the 1990s, there was a a large number of people that immigrated back to Japan uh, because there was a a huge labor force that was missing. And there there was these vacant seats, these job openings. And so there was a mass immigration to Japan. However, here's what's interesting is that these immigrants were of Japanese descent. They look Japanese, okay, but but hundreds of thousands of them are coming back. They're culturized in Brazil. Looks like a duck, but does not walk or talk like a duck. Okay, looks Japanese, but loves carnival and, 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 and South America and, and, and is wild and crazy and Latin. In the book of Acts, Jerusalem, it's an international city besieged and conquered over and over again by one empire after another. 
Now, Jerusalem, it's currently under Roman rule at this period in history. And although it's still the epicenter of Judaism, it is also the birthplace of Christianity. The Roman Empire, it, it tended to move groups of people around. Okay, and, and now there was a large group of people. Okay, these are second-hand believers living in or visiting Jerusalem. Second-hand, people who, who did not necessarily witness the first-hand life of Jesus, but have now come to believe in Jesus. And many of these people are Jewish descent, but not Jewish culture. Okay, they're called Hellenists. Looks like a duck, but does not walk or talk like a duck. And this is where Stephen comes in. And a handful of weeks ago, Pastor Kevin talked about the, this laying on of hands and this raising up of the deacons or, or these other leaders, okay, to help the apostles. This is what I love about Stephen. Stephen, the Hellenists chose some of their own. Okay, so he's chosen from within to help serve the needs of the apostles. Stephen, and this is what it says about him over and over again, he's the first named of those that are chosen. He's a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. He's full of grace and power. He's doing great wonders and signs among the people. Stephen is trusted amongst his fellows. He is a man chosen by the people. He's full of the Holy Spirit. And he is the first person, besides the apostles, that, that is recorded of doing signs and wonders. And Acts chapter 6 talk, says this about Stephen, verse 8. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue who began to argue with Stephen. But they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, we have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the San Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, this fellow never stopped speaking against this holy place and against the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. This is what I, I love this description. They're accusing this man, and then they look at him, and his face is like that of the face of an angel. Something was different about this man. This is what we can know. His face was like an angel is how they, they describe him. This is not unlike Jesus' transfiguration in Matthew 17. This is not unlike in, in Exodus chapter 34 when Moses comes down from Mount Sinai. Okay, face. is that There's an appearance. There's something that's different. Stephen was close to God and his face is reflecting God's glory as a result of being in God's presence. This is an indication that what happens next, his speech, his defense, is indeed inspired. Stephen's speech in chapter 7, this is the longest speech recorded in the book of Acts. Stephen's speech, it's a history lesson. He, he is summarizing parts of the Old Testament, right? This is the only Bible that they had at this point in history. And he's, and he's summarizing parts of it to prove God's original intent. Here's what we can assume is that, that the people had strayed from God's original intent. He's giving a history lesson to the Sanhedrin. Okay, there's a little bit of irony here. These are the experts. These are the men who would have every single law memorized from the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. He is telling them what they should already know. He's giving the experts a lesson in their own history. But see, although they are experts in the law, they've missed the point. They've missed what God is doing. Chapter 7, verses 1 through 43, Stephen's he, he first explains that Jerusalem is not the only locale for God's revelation. Okay, God addressed his people in other locations, Mesopotamia and Egypt. This is a big deal for them. So next, what happens is Stephen explains that the temple is not a divine invention. Solomon was, was eventually allowed 
to build a permanent facility. But before that, the Jews had a mobile tabernacle. They had a tent in the desert. Stephen's speech then takes an unexpected turn at verse 41, giving a a nice history lesson. We all are familiar with this part. Until this point, his speech is is very familiar to his audience and it's simply historical. That's how they would perceive this. Yeah, he's giving us a history lesson. We know this part. He moves the focal point from historical Israel to now so that he can include his present audience, those that are accusing him. The modern religious leaders and keepers of the law Verse 44, our ancestors had the tabernacle of the covenant law with them in the wilderness. It had been made as God directed Moses according to the pattern he had seen. After receiving the tabernacle, our ancestors under Joshua brought it with them when they took the land from the nations God drove out before them. It remained in the land until the time of David, who enjoyed God's favor and asked that he might provide a dwelling place for for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. This is generations later. Okay, however, the Most High does not live in houses made by human hands. As the prophet prophet says, this this is from Isaiah 66. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things? God is not confined to a location or a building. Stephen is methodically attacking the pillars of this traditional religion. One by one by one, he's tearing them down using their very own scripture. He's calling out this problematic, this is how we've always done things, thinking. He's calling it out. And he's saying, we're stuck, you're stuck. Now here it comes. Stephen is a lyrical assassin at this point in time. This is the moment for the mic drop, all right? This is when he flips the entire weight of his words and points out issues of disobedience and sin, idolatry, and murder. Verse 51, you stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You, You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was given through angels but have not obeyed it. Stephen denounces all that his accusers bring at him. Denounces all that his false accusers conjure up. And then accuses his accusers of doing exactly what they are accusing him of. Stephen methodically tears down every pillar, every single one, every pillar of their religion. He dismantles the foundation of their security. And then the final point of his speech has his accusers frothing at the mouth. He uses the Torah, which is the five, first five books of the Bible, which, which these religious law keepers, they use this as a document for their security. They're, they're, it's a document for their worth. Obey these commands and you're worth something. And he points out that it is actually not a document of your worth. It's actually a document used to chronicle Israel's sin and disobedience. It's a document used to bring Israel to a point that they know that they need a savior. Israel needs a savior, but the Torah documents time and time again when they rejected God's chosen men and women. This is not a document of your value. I mean, it it is at a level, but this is a document of of how invaluable you are because God wants to send a savior to save you. It's a document of your your depravity and need. You, this is where he turns it, you have rejected God's chosen messengers again and again, and then he brings up some of these pillars of the faith, right? Joseph was rejected by his brothers. Moses was rejected by God's chosen people, and even Jesus was. The perfect sacrifice, the Son of God, has recently been rejected and subsequently murdered just a few chapters ago. Stephen is pointing out their hypocrisy. These are supposed to be the experts of the law, the experts of God's word. He is shouting to them. It's not enough to just know. It is important to do, know, and Obey God's word. 
James 1 verse 22 says, but don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only fooling yourselves. He's quoting the book of James before it's even officially part of the Bible. You must know, but you also must do. It's impossible to have one without the other. We cannot just know his word and ignore it in action or in speech. But, but we also cannot obey his word without knowing it. We have to know and obey, take time to know so that we can obey, but we must obey once we know. And then here we go, verse 54. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him, but Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold the sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. He, fell, he died because they killed him. These are the religious leaders, those that are supposed to uphold the law, yet all semblance of order seems to disappear in this moment. All semblance of, uh, of self-control and, 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 and piousness, it's gone. They, they, they lose control of themselves. There's no formal trial, there's no discussion, no sentence for condemnation, which suggests that they were actually not following any official procedure or protocol at this point. They cover their ears, nah, 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 nah I can't hear you. They're, they're, they're covering their ears, they're shouting, not listening to what Stephen has to say anymore. They seize him, they drag him out of the town, and they murder him. Happy New Year. Within the Roman Empire, capital punishment was actually supposed to be carried out by the Romans, which is what they did with Jesus. If you remember, they bring him back and forth to all these courts and, and everybody's washing their hands of him. He's crucified in a Roman way. But an offense against the temple, the religious status quo could possibly be prosecuted by the, possibly be prosecuted by the religious leaders. This was not a typical execution under Roman rule. This is a mob hit by an angry religious community who would have somehow claimed, somehow worked it, found a loophole to claim special legal permissions. But see, do you happen to see the, the, the resemblance here, the reflection of something else? An innocent man performing signs and miracles, dragged before the religious leaders, murdered by an angry mob, and at the end asked for forgiveness for his prosecutors. Stephen gets it. But what did Stephen know? What would compel this man to speak these things in boldness and have such courage in, in, in the face of death? He knew that Jesus the Son was on the same level as God the Father. See, Jesus forgave his prosecutors and then committed himself into God's hands. Stephen forgave his accusers and then committed himself into Jesus' hands. Like it says, Lord, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. He, cons he commits himself in his dying breath into Jesus' hands. Stephen may have spoken harsh words to his accusers while they were in trial, denouncing their sin and disobedience to God, but, but in his last breath, he showed genuine Christian concern. The other thing that, that Stephen knew, he knew that being with Jesus was greater than any sacrifice he could ever make. In verse 56, Stephen refers to Jesus as the Son of Man. This is unusual. Outside of the Gospels, okay, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's really unusual. Jesus referred to himself as that lots of times, but it's very unusual for Jesus to be called the Son of Man outside of the Gospels. In the middle of his horrendous death, Stephen recognizes Jesus as the one who suffered and was vindicated by God. And then he has this vision, the significance of Jesus standing, standing at the right hand of God, not sitting, standing at the right hand of God. It, 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 he's, he's advocating for Stephen's cause and welcoming him into God's presence. Jesus goes before us so that he can welcome us when we get there. 
There's nowhere, nothing that we can experience, no place that we can go that Jesus hasn't already been there. Stephen is the first martyr of the apostolic church. And his example, if you, if you read about martyrs, history of martyrs from around the world, you will see time and time again that they follow his example in grace and in speech, in power and in wisdom. But here's, here's the other question is what didn't Stephen know? He had no idea the global repercussions his death would have on the church. Many members of the church ran for their lives because they were afraid. They took off. But wherever they went, they brought the gospel with them. His speech critiqued traditional Judaism and argued the need for evangelism beyond their own community. This is such an important part of the book of Acts. This is a pivoting moment because before this moment, the gospel was preached primarily to the Jews. This is the pivot point for the gospel to be shared abroad. His martyrdom, his sacrifice, his death was the catalyst. This was the propellant, okay, for the good news of Jesus to be shared with the Gentiles. This is what brought the good news of Jesus to us, this moment. But he had no idea what was going to happen. And after his death, honestly, all hell broke loose for the local church. Chapter eight, verse one, and Saul approved of their killing. Saul, approved, Saul, Saul is unaffected by this horrendous act. There's only, there's an angry, you know, there, he's not angry. He's got this calculated response. There's anger with the religious leaders, the frothing of the mouth, but here's Paul standing calculated and confident. Saul, he's calculated, he's observant and standing watch. He's standing watch in approval. This moment, this is the moment that unhinged him. Saul approved of their killing him, and on that day a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Saul was pious. He was devout, he was fanatical, and he was hungry to carry out atrocities to those who would oppose his religion. Not in love. He was going to tear him down. Saul remains unmoved. In fact, he approves of their killing, Stephen. The indifference he shows us at the beginning of Acts chapter 8 will only emphasize, emphasize his, his supernatural conversion later on. Stephen's martyrdom was the beginning of the beginning for the advancement of the gospel, but, but Stephen's martyrdom was the beginning of the end for a zealous and influential religious leader named Saul. Dun, dun, dun. This will come at a later time. But here's the, the implication of Stephen's speech, and, and it's still vital for us today. Here's the implication. God is free to move beyond any boundaries, beyond Judea, Jerusalem, to the ends of the earth. Stephen's speech implies this, exclusivity is man-made and a poor substitute. He's referring to the physical temple and its exclusive, exclusive nature. And he's saying, no, no more. And he's also emphasizing that God's work is dynamic. They missed the point of what God was doing throughout history, their own history. They missed it. History repeated again and again and again. God is in constant motion, constant activity. Yes, he, he, he is constant. He is faithful. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever, but he is moving and doing things in people's hearts. We don't want to miss it. We might never know the influence our lives have on other people, but Stephen shows us that it's worth the risk. This isn't an easy statement for me to make. For, for many people, this has been an absolutely horrible year. Loss and grief. I'm not saying unprecedented and unusual. Horrible. For many people, loneliness, depression, anxiety. Horrible. But I want to say this. Jesus is worth the risk. Take a moment, just Google the, the name Frank Jenner. He was a, a guy in George Street, 
in Australia, in Sydney, Australia. And, and this man, uh, he had gotten saved, and, and there's this story uh, of him. He would jump out from this alley and ask people, do, if you died tonight, do you know where you're going to go? And, and what's crazy is that he, he made a commitment to God. I'm going to tell 10 people a day. I'm going to ask 10 people a day this question and then, then tell them about Jesus. He did this for 16 years. He had told over 50,000 people about Jesus and had never heard of a single person changing their life around. Over 10,000. Now, now, the reason the story is out is because people did come to know Jesus and it, and it was this kind of global thing from all over the place, but he didn't know, but he kept going. He had no idea what impact his life had. None. But it was worth the risk. Regardless of what is in front of you, and I don't know your situation, but I do know this, regardless of what is in front of you, Jesus has gone on ahead. He's familiar with the risk and he's waiting to greet you on the other side. See, the good news is, uh, of Jesus is unstoppable. Especially when we can know and have confidence that Jesus is advocating for us. So I want to go back to something that Pastor Kevin said at the beginning of 2020. One person. One story. Who is one person? Maybe you've been praying for them, but this is the year to risk it all. And tell them about Jesus. Know your story. Stephen knew his story and their story and told it in such a way that it changed everything. What risk should you be taking? Pray with me. Jesus, we, we cannot do this alone. I cannot have the courage that Stephen had without your Holy Spirit. So Jesus, I ask that today you would come and fill every single person up with your Holy Spirit, with your power, with your courage to do the things that you're calling us to do. You are moving, and God, I want to be right on your coattails. You are doing things, and I want to be right there with you. I believe that today you're asking people to step out in courage and in faith and, and, and go beyond themselves to do things that you're saying it's worth it. Even if you never know the influence or the impact or, or the change that you make because of that decision, it's worth it. And if you don't know Jesus, and if you're saying today, I, I, I need something, I need some hope, I, I need courage, I need a reason to, to wake up tomorrow, would you pray this with me? Jesus, I surrender everything to you. I'm hearing today that this is a pretty risky decision, but I give it to you. I realize that this is a journey and I may mess up today and tomorrow and the next hundred days, but Jesus, I want to continue to surrender my life to you and allow you to use me to take risks that I hear are worth taking so that you can be glorified, so that your good news can be shared. In Jesus' name, amen. It wasn't super inspiring, I know, but I'm hoping it's challenging you to look at tomorrow a little bit different. And if you surrendered your life to Jesus today, would you please text RCC Life to 97000? You'll receive a, a series of videos uh, over the next week of how you can begin a relationship and develop some habits of getting in His presence and being a, a reflection of Him. And, and if you need prayer, uh, you can connect with your host. They're online, or you can also text RCC Pray to 97000, and we will partner with you in prayer. I love you. Be blessed. There are better things to come. Amen.